This is CBC Here and Now. Well, if you like these mild temperatures, the pattern over the next week or so, certainly into the first week of December, means there's plenty more where that came from. If you could assist somebody with a brown paper bag lunch or, you know, get them a hot meal or, you know, get them a, some services they might need, then, you know, that's a good thing. A partial solution in Happy Valley Goose Bay, where help for the homeless is desperately needed. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. We start with today's medical briefing. Four new cases of COVID-19 to report. Three of those cases are still under investigation as public health works to determine their sources. One of today's cases is in the eastern region, a man in his 60s, and that case is related to the Grand Bank cluster, though he is not a resident of Blue Crest Cottages. And there are two more cases in the eastern region, a man and a woman, both in their 50s. There's also a woman in the western region has tested positive. She is in her 40s, and today the province's chief medical officer stressed that those last three cases are new. Now, this does not mean public health is unable to identify the source of those cases. It does mean that the investigation has only just started. Now, it's been the light at the end of a long, dark pandemic tunnel. Vaccines against COVID-19, they should be available soon. But what does soon mean and when will we actually get our sleeves rolled up? What does that mean for Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, Peter Cowan is here now. He joins us live from our newsroom. So what do we know, Peter, about when we can actually uh, see these vaccines get here? The Premier said he's expecting with the latest estimates that it'll be January that they start rolling up the very first vaccines in Newfoundland and Labrador. But that does not mean that everyone's going to be able to get one. The supplies are going to be very limited. Based on the numbers that the federal government released yesterday, the Premier says he expects 40 to 50,000 people will be vaccinated by the end of March. So that's only about 10% of the population. So now one of the key questions is who's going to be first in line? This is being discussed nationally, but there's already a general idea of who's going to take priority. So the most vulnerable, uh, so people in long-term care facilities, elderly people, people with comorbidities, uh, indigenous communities and healthcare providers. And, uh, you know, we, it was stressed on the call uh, from my perspective that it would be great if we had a Canadian guideline uh, so that we could all follow, albeit with some modifications for local jurisdictions and differences of populations and geography. But So one of the big challenges here is going to be the logistics. Uh, one of the vaccines needs to be kept at minus 70 degrees. That's well below temperatures for normal freezers. Uh, so who are they going to turn to in order to help get this done? Well, today, Andrew Fury said it's going to be the military that they lean on in order to help make this happen. I was encouraged that the uh, armed for forces were, had been uh, had been offered, and certainly that's uh, that's help we're going to avail of. Uh, and we've already reached out to them and have had uh, conversations about how to integrate them with the work that's already being done here uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador with the with our vaccine committee. Now, the actual vaccines for most people are still months and months and months away. And so that's why public health officials today were reminding people that this is not the time to let your guard down. Uh, this is they're saying you're going to have to keep up things like putting on a mask, physical distancing, washing your hands, staying home when you're sick, all those things we've gotten used to over the last eight months. Carolyn. Thanks so much, Peter. That's hearing us. Peter Cowan reporting live. Moving now to another vaccine, the flu shot. The province also provided an update on our influenza immunization rate today. According to the health minister, 189,000 people have already received the flu shot. That's nearly 60,000 more people than this time last year. But that's still nowhere near the province's goal. The health department hopes 85% of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians will get the needle this season. If everyone who currently has an appointment booked for the shot follows through, half of the province will be vaccinated against the flu. That is the one thing that we do have a vaccine for, uh, which you can avoid. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to avoid the flu where it's all possible.
public exams for intermediate and high school students this June have been canceled. The education minister says students lost two and a half months of learning last year, and this will give teachers and students the stability of knowing they don't have to focus on publics during an already stressful pandemic. Public exams for January had already been called down. Tom Osborne says the education department is taking a hard look at how student evaluation will be done in the future. I know in the mid 1990s public exams were cancelled and our post-secondary institutions here in the province at that particular time expressed some concern that our students were ill-prepared um, going into our post-secondary institutions. So the decision was made in, in 2000 to reinstitute uh, public exams. So, you know, it's, uh, I know some other provinces don't have them, but whether or not, uh, um, you know, it, it'll be public exams or some other sor sort of uh, or form of um, standardized measurement throughout the province. We do need to ensure that uh, students, whether they're in St. John's, St. Lawrence, St. Anthony or Goose Bay, have a, a, a standardized level of learning and education. So, you know, we, we, uh, we need to have a good look at this uh, going forward as well. So some public exam relief for young people, but 2020 has been a long, brutal haul for many teenagers and other young people. And today, the province's chief medical officer of health called on Newfoundlanders and Labradorians to show some compassion for each other in the face of the ongoing stress and uncertainty that we're all living with, especially for children who may face scrutiny and suspicion and stigma due to a COVID diagnosis. Stigmatization should not be happening. It is completely unacceptable, and to be honest, it is heartbreaking for me to hear. If you are a parent and witness any ill treatment, discrimination, or bullying of a child, regardless of whether they have a parent that is a rotational worker or simply because they had a runny nose, I implore you to act. Act by talking to your children, by showing empathy. Ask your child to imagine themselves in the classmate's position and how sad and worried they must be feeling. Teach them the golden rule to treat others as you want to be treated. And Dr. Fitzgerald also spoke about alert level three today, what it could look like and what it would take to trigger an increase in restrictions once again. And we'll have her take on that in about 35 minutes. <laughs> Well, some showers on the go earlier today, certainly along the uh, west coast. And then we saw that in the east as well and much milder temperatures uh, this afternoon, even seeing some of those milder temperatures up through uh, southeastern portions of Labrador. Here's where we sat for most of the day. 12 degrees in St. John's. That is well above where we should be sitting this time of year. 10 degrees in Badger, 14 in Corner Brook and then hovering around the zero degree mark for Lab City uh, earlier today. Now that is about six degrees warmer than it was last night uh, here in St. John's and 12 degrees warmer for Corner Brook. The good news is, is that this will generally stick around and the winds uh, are going to stay generally light as we head through the day tomorrow. Certainly along the west coast, you're looking at 10 to 15 kilometer per hour winds, but it will be breezy in the east. That will eventually ease, but I'll have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, seven Grossmorn communities are getting a boost from government. The funding aims to boost tourism once the pandemic ends and people can once again travel. While business operators welcome the support, they still have to prepare for a potentially bleak tourism season ahead. Here and now's Colleen Connors has more from Corner Brook. Not your typical visit. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to join you all virtually today. Although I was, certainly wish I could be there in beautiful Rocky Harbour instead. But he brings good news for the tourism operators. $330,000 for the Grossmorn Cooperating Association, or the Grossmorn Co-op, a non-for-profit group made up of seven communities that showcases all that's wonderful about the National Park. The funding will help identify, design and detail the implementation of several tourism projects in the park. I feel like we're we're now somewhere where we can grab onto something and advance the vision and advance um, the agenda. Montague says that that money is needed now. Planning for 2021 festivals and events, virtual or not, is already happening and groups need to know what funding is available. 
Tourism was bleak this past summer with many businesses like this hostel and guiding company barely surviving. Many switched their focus to staycationers offering shorter tours instead of the more pricey week-long adventures with international visitors. People were either closed or operating at 10-15% capacity. So again, where's next year going to go? Some may not open. Um, it's a very difficult uh, question for, for right now, but we have to move forward however we can, develop some kind of vision, some kind of path, and uh, come up uh, with uh, where it is we, we can go. We all know that Gros Morne is one of the province's top tourist destinations. Trust me, I talk about it everywhere I go in this country. MP Goody Hutching says the funding will mean the area is better prepared for a large influx of visitors, whenever that may be. So this area will be ready to rock and roll, be it ready for local tourists, be it ready for Atlantic Canada, be it ready for Canada and then the world. They will be ready with planning, new products, upgraded products, a whole new way of marketing, visiting. It's going to be a phenomenal thing for the area. All seven communities are on board to develop this regional tourism plan. And as many tourism operators said in that virtual meeting today, planning for the upcoming season, whatever that may look like, has got to start now. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, it's been more than six weeks since a hiker from this province went missing in Manning Park, British Columbia. Jordan Natterer was last seen leaving his Vancouver apartment on October 10th, but his family isn't giving up. They're still determined to find the 25-year-old. Natterer's mother tells CBC they expect more information this coming Monday following a massive plane search. The family is calling for volunteers to help analyze data collected because they now fear Jordan wandered outside the park's boundaries. A virtual candlelight vigil was held for Natterer last night, something Josie Natterer calls heartwarming. It was um, the support that we needed right now. It really picked myself and my husband up. Um, this has been a very challenging time for our entire family. It took us to a, to a, to a very comforting place. Um, we've been going through so much tragedy and up and down and up and down. Our mornings start with hope and then when nothing is found that day, it's, it's, it's hard on all of us. So um, having the vigil last night just, you know, brought a warm feeling to our hearts. Well, it's time to rethink the future of the RCMP. This according to a new report calling out the force's toxic culture. It says the RCMP systemically tolerates misogynistic, racist and homophobic attitudes. And a former officer from this province was one of the main plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit brought forth by current and former RCMP officers. And she says the force is not capable of fixing itself. I, I have lost all hope that they can do it from within and because they've had ample opportunity. They've known since the 80s that this was a problem. And report after report after report over the years has suggested the, the very first thing, bring in an outside entity to, to do this. And if they don't do that, none of the other 51 or 50 recommendations will, you know, you, you can't, it, it won't change. It won't change. Now, another disturbing finding in that report is the level of violence and the numbers of sexual assault allegations within the force itself. More of my conversation with Janet Merlo ahead on Here and Now. Well, CBC News has new information about what police discovered during a homicide investigation. This was the scene on Craig Miller Avenue in St. John's over the summer after James Cody was found shot to death on the street. Police investigators zeroed in on a nearby home executing search warrants and according to court documents, they found nearly half a million dollars in cash there. Well, the Mounties have now launched a money laundering and proceeds of crime investigation focused on the owner of that house, Kurt Churchill. No charges have been laid in that RCMP money laundering investigation or in the RNC-led homicide investigation. The RNC has not public, uh, publicly identified any suspects in the Cody case. A Conception-based South principal charged with assaulting students won a small but significant battle today in court. Robin McGraw's lawyers defeated an application that would have seen all the allegations against him linked together. That would have meant the evidence from one allegation could be used to support the other 12. 
McGraw is accused of assaulting four young students with disabilities during the 2017-2018 school year. The judge will now assess each claim individually. With this application out of the way, the next step is for the lawyers to give closing arguments. That's expected to happen next month. There's no really no place to, to go to when like um, when it's cold out and like you no know, there's a lot of homeless people around here in Happy Valley Goose Bay and like um since COVID come around there's no there's uh, hardly any places that we could go to and like um it'd be like it'd be really cold out. Well, this week, our Garrett Barry brought us the story of homeless men and women in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, many services that help this vulnerable population have been suspended or cut back. But some new help is on the way. A partnership between the town council and the homeless shelter is creating an outreach coordinator to help bridge the gap. I've advocated the coalition for a long time for this position. I mean, it could be anyone really out in the community that needs assistance and we're hoping that that outreach coordinator will be able to, you know, could be provide them a brown paper bag lunch. It could be to refer them to some mental health counseling. It could be to help them, you know, if they want to get back home or it could be help them with housing. There's lots that could be done with outreach in the community and I think that's the focus we need to take. We're offering a service. Right now there's nobody offering them a service out in the campsites or wherever they're, they might be through the community. So this will certainly benefit. It's not going to fix the problem, but it'll help people out there that need the assistance. There's a sense in speaking to some of the people at the shelter and, and some of the people at the Friendship Centre that this is a problem that the need is growing in a way. Would you agree with that, that over the last couple of years you've seen an increased need? Oh, most definitely. I mean, we started out you know, four, five or six years ago, four or five years ago, we started out with uh, only eight or 10. And now we're seeing high numbers, you know, 60, 70 people that are, you know, that could avail of services. One of the things I, I've heard from speaking with some of the men who, who are homeless this year is they've noticed a big change since COVID started with a lot of the little daytime support that they had, that's been shut down. They can't get to the warm room. They can't really get to the library the same way they used to, to do. And I'm wondering if you think the outreach coordinator will will be able to assist in, in that world. Because one of the problems, it seems like, is there's nowhere warm to go. Yes, and, and you know, that's very unfortunate. And and, and they're right. The, uh, the, you know, the individuals that are living this life every day, uh, we, we don't know what they're going through. I mean, when the shelter is closed from 8 in the morning till 8 at night, they got to be out all day long. So... You know, it's unfortunate that they're left in that situation. And, you know, I believe that we should try to come up with a, 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 an answer to, you know, to help them out. And, you know, for them to be able to, we need to work with the organizations in town for them to have a place to go and keep warm. And if that's something the province needs to look at, then they should look at it. Because nobody should be left out in the cold this time of year. I mean, I'm standing here now and it's cold. Yeah. So nobody should be left out, and I think this is something that we really need to make a priority and, and uh, you know, try to find a, a, you know, to deal with the situation and, and uh, have nobody out in the cold it is not acceptable. Well, taking a look at the temperatures across the country, we've got warm in the east and warm in the west, and this trend will generally continue as we head through the next couple of weeks, but I'll have all those details coming up.
Ashley's here now with a look at the weather. Another nice mild day today. It was. Double digits. Double digits. Yeah, reached a high near 12 degrees in St. John. And it's still a beautiful evening mm -hmm. out there. Let's take a look at the temperatures sitting at 10 uh, in St. John's. 10 in Gander as well. Cornerbrook, another lovely, or at least a lovely evening. 12 degrees right now. And then temperatures above zero for Happy Valley Goose Bay as well, sitting at uh, 2 degrees currently. So we do have uh, plenty of showers on the go, though, in the west. They've moved off now, seeing some clearing skies, which I thought would happen before sunset in the east, but that didn't. Uh, but it does look like it'll be a fairly uh, nice evening in the east. We might see a few showers after midnight, but overall the main activity uh, and rain and uh, will be on the west coast and that'll head towards central. As we head into the early morning hours, a lovely uh, evening expected up for Labrador as well with uh, not a whole lot going on. Maybe along the street straight you'll see uh, some showers, but overall all the action will be for uh, the island. Here's where we'll be sitting temperature wise. Maybe lose another degree in St. John's, but then that's about it. Nine degrees overnight tonight. Uh, the winds will stay brisk though. Southwesterly is 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. And then as we head towards the west coast, those winds will ease a little cooler. Six degrees, so your temperatures will drop uh, in Cornerbrook and then for the northern peninsula hovering around the one degree mark tonight, but whatever does fall should fall as rain uh, up through the big land. You're looking at a chilly evening again for Lab City, maybe a few flurries for you and then uh, otherwise just partly to mostly cloudy skies. Happy Valley Goose Bay going down to minus nine tonight and then minus three for Cartwright. So taking a look at the future tracker for tomorrow, mainly we'll see rain in the east. Periods of rain heavy at times through the day. Likely some drizzle and a few showers on the west coast, but as we start to see uh, some of that cooler air move in, that more northerly flow, we will see um, the potential for some flurries up across uh, the northern peninsula, certainly into the evening hours and then eventually into the early morning hours for the rest of uh, the rest of the West Coast. So temperatures tomorrow in the east are going to be mild again. Should reach a high near 14 degrees for St. John's. That's about 10, 9, 10 degrees above where we should be sitting for this time of year. But those winds are going to stay brisk again. Southwesterly is uh, 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. Similar temperatures as we head towards Clarenville and Bonavista and even through central as well. 12 degrees for Gander. A little cooler along the north though. Uh, Twilling Gate, you're looking or at least the north. Uh, west or northeast coast six degrees uh, for tomorrow afternoon and then we've got those cooler temperatures but light winds tomorrow in the west eventually the temperatures in the upper atmosphere are going to drop so things will change over to flurry certainly in the higher elevations along the west coast six degrees for corner brook and then the northern peninsula again some periods of snow possible into the evening hours one degree for st anthony but once you get north of the strait things should be beautiful tomorrow uh, one degree in mary's harbor and uh, northwesterly is 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. So not a whole lot of wind to speak of up through northern portions of Labrador, though it will be gusty tomorrow and then uh, out of the west with plenty of sunshine for the rest. Few flurries possible in uh, Lab West. Now, as we head into Sunday, that cooler air will move in again. So it is looking like periods of snow, the story for the northern peninsula and parts of the west coast, as well as southeastern portions of Labrador. But it will be generally quiet, at least towards the evening hours. Uh, the further east you go as that low pulls away and then a ridge of high pressure moves in on Monday, clearing things out. Actually looks like a pretty nice start to the week. Then the next system will roll in Monday night at this point. The timing uh, we will still figure that one out. But at this point, it's looking like Monday night we'll start to see some some uh, snow move in and that's the story as we head through Tuesday as well. So temperatures for Sunday will be much cooler. Like I said, drop in those temperatures down to three degrees and then with that potential of showers changing over to flurries as those temperatures drop should see a temperature near six degrees in St. John's and everything that does fall should fall as showers. Here's a look at the snowfall totals. This will be for uh, Saturday night into Sunday uh, for the northern peninsula and southeastern portions of Labrador. Could pick up five to ten centimeters of snow. Some pockets of ten to fifteen are certainly possible. Uh, but by Monday, then we'll start to see those things clear out. Maybe some lingering flurries in the morning, but then plenty of sunshine through the afternoon. Temperatures back down even below where we should be sitting for this time of year. Uh, two, three degrees and then cool up through the big land as well. Minus seven for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now, I've been talking about the jet stream a lot over the last little bit and the pattern over the next week or so, certainly into the first week of December, 
is looking like we're going to see some fairly mild temperatures. This uh, is through Monday, so we'll start to see that big dip, dip in the jet stream uh, through central Canada, and that allows all of that warm, mild air to move our way, and it looks like it's going to stick around. Uh, at least through, like I said, the first week of December, but even in past that, we'll see these waves of warmer temperatures and cooler temperatures. So if you like that, that's certainly good news, but uh, it is going to take a little while to get there this weekend. By Wednesday is when we should see that warm up and then uh, the potential for some showers. That will be our next weather maker, it looks like at this point. Uh, for both central and western Newfoundland, we're looking at a similar warm up gradually uh, into the middle of the week. But uh, like I said, we should be sitting around five degrees around this time of year. So 12 degrees is well above seasonable. Uh, for eastern Labrador, you're looking at temperatures uh, into the minus single digits. And then by Wednesday, this is when we could see some freezing rain set up. And that's the story for uh, Lab West as well. So we'll certainly keep an eye on that one. Now, I just wanted to share quickly this wonderful shot. It's been warm and uh, I guess a perfect night for a paddle. Vanessa shared this one with us from uh, Triton Harbor. Thank you for that. If you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. A national institution under fire. The Mounties have a toxic culture that encourages the hatred of women and racist and homophobic attitudes. Those are just some of the findings in a report that takes scathing to an entirely new level. Janet Merlo, originally from Harbour Grace, was one of the plaintiffs who first started to expose problems within the RCMP in a massive and successful lawsuit. And she joins us now from Nanaimo. So Janet, this report talks about broken lives, broken dreams in its title. How does that title reflect the reality of what you experienced? It reflects it almost perfectly, actually. The, it, the, the fallout from the harassment has, has broken many lives and, and certainly many career dreams of a lot of women. Some of your experiences actually changed the way you decided to have a family. Can you explain that to us? When I first got pregnant with my oldest daughter, she, uh, she's now 27, when, when that happened and after a certain point in the pregnancy, I could be I had to be taken off the road because I couldn't be responding to calls with my gun belt and gear and, and risk losing a pregnancy. So they transfer you into the office and, and to an office duty. And when I did that and brought in the note from the doctor, I was yelled at and name called, told to get my priorities straight. Either I was going to have a, a, a career in the RCMP or I was going to pop out kids my whole life. And, and it was my first pregnancy and I was thrilled. and. And it just, it just took the wind right out of all of that excitement. And for the rest of the pregnancy, I'd go into the office and they'd say, oh, Merlo, can you take that call? Or, oh, no, you're knocked up. Or, or, and when I got back from mat leave, it was like, Merlo, can you take that call? Or are you pregnant again? And it, and thus we didn't have our second child for five years because five years later because i uh, i would not go into that office with another note while that those same management people were in the in power cuz i just couldn't do it again so it it changed it changed the order and and the timing of of even having children so that that's how much it impacted life and that's you know just uh, one kind of example but the report actually looks at very serious um sexual assaults within the force. What was your reaction to that? I knew that was coming. I knew that it was a reality within the force because I've heard it for years and, and heard a lot about it. The, the only thing that disappointed me was the large number, 131 rapes, which, you know, meant there's 131 rapists in the RCMP or less than that who've done it with multiple, two multiple women. And, and that's, that's very upsetting. These horrible actions as discovered by former Chief Justice Bastarash, he seems to say that you can't change the, the RCMP cannot be changed on its own because if that was going to happen, it would have happened by now. Do you have any hope that maybe this might result in some change? If they don't bring in an outside entity to reorganize and restructure the RCMP, the members will be right back in the class action again within a few years. I, I have lost all hope that they can do it from within and because they've had ample opportunity, they've known since the 80s that this was a problem and report after report after report over the years has suggested 
the, the very first thing, bring in an outside entity to, to do this. And if they don't do that, none of the other 51 or 50 recommendations will, you know, you, you can't, it, it won't change. The fact that we have, you know, a, a female commissioner of the RCMP, does that give you any hope? Is there maybe a, a greater empathy there than there has been before? I think there's greater empathy and I think there's an understanding of the trouble within the force and how toxic it is on her own trying to clean it up without the support of the masses behind her I I think her hands are probably going to be tied and there again you know she's been in power for for however long now a couple of years and and there's really been nothing because I still hear from women who are having trouble in the force so there's no faith to go to the new leadership they come to me or come to other women who've been through the, the legal process asking what their options are. All right, Ms. Merlo, obviously still a very difficult story. Appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am from St. John's from Google, and I'm currently in Tanzania, which is in East Africa. I am in a city of 10 million people, in a country that is smaller than Newfoundland with 90 million people in it. 
Newfoundlanders and Labradorians living around the globe in the middle of a pandemic. Basically, we shopped at a needs convenience store, basically. A needs convenience store equivalent yeah, for like, two like months. A, like a Marie's, like a Marie's <laughs> mini bar. Far From Home, Wednesdays on Here and Now. Starting this spring, some of the province's most vulnerable youth will have free access to a university education here at MUN. Joining me now is MUN's president, Bayan Timmins. So Dr. Timmins, can you tell us a bit about this new program? So this new program is for children who've been in the foster system and to provide them with a hand up, leg up, um, to get access to university. And it's really important for those young people to see it and to know that university is accessible for them. How will the program work? So a child, a child, be a youth at this point, or a young adult, would identify that they have been in the foster system and we will provide their tuition coverage for them. And this is so important that I'm personally gonna to donate to cover one of the, the young people that come through to cover all their costs. So I think it's really an exciting time. And as someone who struggled to go to university, came from a family where no one went to university, all six of us, my brothers and sisters, got access to a university education. It changed our lives. So this is a program that changes lives. How many uh, students will be able to avail of this program? So right now we've said 20. But I guarantee you, if there's more than 20 that step up, we're lifting that cap. Our registrar does not know that yet, but I'm saying this. I want to make sure that anyone who has gone through the foster system has access to uh, university education with undue harm. And this is for the full four years, right? Full four years, absolutely. And how is the university going to pay for this? I mentioned that I'm going to cover one. <laughs> uh, we will be looking at donations, definitely. But if not, we will just look at our own resources. This is so important that we will divert funds into this. I'm hoping that this will captivate our community, that people will see this as a cause to get behind, and um, that they'll rally like I have and support these young people. How long will the university continue this program for? As long as I'm president, we will continue this program, and I'm hoping into the future. This is so important. This is important for everyone in our community to recognize that you change lives with a university education, and we want, as you said, our most vulnerable to have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I guess we, we understand what the students will get out of this. This is a massive opportunity for them to get a free education, but what does the university get out of this? Well, our university is a university of Newfoundland and Labrador, and we are a university of all citizens. So we will get the satisfaction of knowing that we're reaching our most vulnerable, and I think that's important. There are a lot of you know, people out there who are in vulnerable situations for all kinds of reasons, why target foster care specifically? Well, we do have scholarships and bursaries to support lots of students, but we wanted to target, target this group because so many, when they hit 18 years old, are lost, right? They, they don't have the system behind them to support them. They don't know where they're going. They often uh, look at jobs right away to survive. I wanted to make sure that this group in particular had the hope and the resources for a positive future. Well, you know, if one student, one student comes to Memorial University that wouldn't have come otherwise, then it's been worth it. All right, Ryan Timmons, thank you so much for telling us about it. Thank you. Now, this is quite a big deal for people who have lived through foster care. So let's check in with a group in St. John's who works directly with vulnerable youth. Key Assets is a not-for-profit family services organization and joining me now is the Provincial Director Heather Modlin. So Dr. Modlin, your organization works with children in foster care. How big of a deal is this new program at MUN for them? Yeah, uh, huge, huge. This is, this is, has the potential to really be a game changer for children in care and children who have been in care. Um, and uh, I just, I have to commend Memorial University and Dr. Timmons for her leadership in making this happen. Uh, I think, you know, um, I've worked with young people in care for a really long time and, um, and I've known some extraordinarily intelligent, uh, innovative, creative, resilient young people who um, haven't always had the same opportunities in life that other children may have. And I think, um, you know, we know the research says 
that when an opportunity is presented, when children know there's an opportunity, they will, they will rise to meet that. And I think one of the things that's happened here with this decision is that children in care have gotten a really loud and clear message from the university that we believe in you, uh, you belong here, um, and we want to make it possible for you to come to university and, and get an education with us. So for some young people who grow up in you know really challenging situations like foster care, I guess they fall into a bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, do you think that this program could help with that, help break that cycle? Oh, absolutely. I think there's a quote, and I don't know who to attribute it to, that says a society is be judged by how well it takes care of its most vulnerable citizens, right? And so I can't think of very many citizens we have that are more vulnerable than children that end up in care for a variety of reasons. And so I think this is just one more example of the way in which we are helping to meet their needs and um, the, the more we can do to meet the needs of, of all citizens, but particularly those that are most vulnerable, um, the, the better we all are for various reasons, you know, uh, and, uh, and beyond that, just to go back to the point you made earlier about breaking the cycle, I mean, whenever we give people an opportunity to get out of the cycle and create a healthier cycle. Uh, there are economic benefits, there are you know, mental health benefits, there are impacts on our health care, so you know, it, it, it repeats itself. So. Well, Heather Modlin, thank you so much for this. Great, thank you very much.
Hey, it's Ife. Farai. And Columbus. And we're three really, really good friends who really, really love to eat. Join us as we put our taste buds to the test and discover the amazing food around St. John's. We ordered the same dish at three places and then we vote for our favorite. Let's get stuffed! But whether or not we'll be re-entering a lockdown is a major question that many people have about the present day pandemic. People want to know what it will look like if the province brings in more restrictions and just what would it take to trigger that? Yes, our Peter Cowan asked those uh, questions at the briefing today. So here's what Dr. Janice Fitzgerald and Premier Andrew Fury had to say. Those are discussions that we're having all the time and, and it's difficult to give um, a definitive measure right off the top because it, it does take some evaluation of the whole situation. So it's whether it's the case, uh, how many, not just how many cases we have, but how many cases that don't, that we can identify a source for. Um, you know, what's the situation in that, uh, in that um, uh, vicinity that we're in? Do we have a lot of travel in and out of that town or uh, is the town fairly isolated? All of these things will um, sort of, um, will, influence our decision as to whether or not we move to another level or not. Um, so there are many things that we will be looking at, um, but certainly non-epi-linked cases, so, so cases that we can't find a source for, um, are a concern for us. Uh, they're kind of like our canary in the coal mine, right? It means that there could be more community, widespread community transmission, so we're always uh, very much on the lookout for those. You mentioned having things be more targeted. Uh, other provinces have come up with zone systems order. Obviously, our health care zones are very large uh, geographically, so it may not make sense. So how do you have a system already set up that would allow you to uh, invoke measures for a specific area? How would that work? I think we need to take that um, on a case-by-case -case basis because, you know, some areas uh, you may need to have uh, depending on the traffic flows and, you know, the movement of people in and out of certain areas, if they're hubs in an area, uh, you may need to have uh, a broader um, area of restrictions. But if you have a place that's more, um, a little more isolated, a little less traffic in and out, you may be able to keep those restrictions narrowed in that area. The regions <laughs> will define themselves as the, uh, if they if they happen and, uh, and different than some of the maritime provinces, uh, which you suggested, Peter, are easy to divide up into squares. Uh, the way that the province has been settled can be uh, leveraged to our advantage should outbreaks occur.
on your street. <laughs> Calling all kids. We're looking to share your stories for our new segment, On Your Street. Interview your pet. Show us how to make your favorite snack or give us a tour of your favorite place. The options are endless. For all the details and to submit your video, head to cbc.ca slash nl and click on the community tab. Time to see who's celebrating. Happy 69th anniversary yesterday to Whitfield and Nina McGraw. Nice tie, Whitfield. A happy 57th wedding anniversary 11 days ago to Hazel and Clayton Penny in Cornerbrook. Happy 66th anniversary greetings to Audrey and Tooney Hunt in Boswarlos. Lloyd and Lillian Redifs are celebrating their 50th anniversary. And a happy 56th anniversary greeting to Edison and Hattie Brown in Rose Blanche. They celebrated on Monday. Also Monday, it was 54 years for Ed and Ivy Herridge from Isla Mort. Happy 53rd anniversary to John and Loretta Howlett of Bay Bulls. Happy 54th anniversary to Norman and Linda Skinner of Galtis. They celebrated on Monday. Tomorrow, Anne and Randall Wellen of Port Port of Port West will celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. On Tuesday, it was a happy 54th wedding anniversary for Milton and Doreen Wells in Paradise. Happy 60th anniversary tomorrow to Junior and Marion Bailey in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 50th anniversary greetings to Derek and Elsie Earl in Lancelot, Labrador. And this coming Tuesday, December 1st, Majors Ray and Joan Stratton will celebrate their 70th wedding anniversary. And tomorrow marks a happy 50th wedding anniversary for Monty and Josephine Fudge in Cornerbrook. Anniversary greetings yesterday to Boyd and Pearl Whalen of Western Bay. They celebrated their 54th. Frank and Shirley Warfield will celebrate 62 years of marriage this Sunday. They're from Charlottetown, Bonavista Bay. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Dawn and Vera Parsons in Dover. Happy 51st anniversary on Sunday to Patrick and Anita Cowell of Point La Haye, St. Mary's Bay. Jack and Geraldine Anderson of Port of Basque will celebrate their 62nd wedding anniversary this Sunday. Happy anniversary greetings uh, going out to Jim and Irene Edwards from Lawn. It's their 62nd. Happy 57th anniversary last Sunday to Wilson and Joyce Nicole. Happy 50th anniversary today to Dorothy and Francis Barney of Lancelou, Labrador. Happy 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Leo and Joyce Keats, originally from Hare Bay, now living in St. John's. Jean and Robin Noseworthy celebrated their 51st wedding anniversary yesterday in Mount Carmel. And tomorrow, Jim and Shirley Mosher in Cornerbrook celebrate their 62nd wedding anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Ed and Bev Sampson. This Sunday, William and Eileen Dwyer and Carboneer, seen here with their great-granddaughter Zoe, will celebrate their 68th anniversary. Also Sunday, celebrating 57 years together are Hubert and Daphne March from Greens Harbor. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Kevin and Lorraine Tobin from Gaskers St. Mary's Bay. And Deanne and Ewart Locke will celebrate their 57th anniversary on Monday. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to Barbara and Mansfield Piercy from Port Rexton, now living in Calagruz. Happy 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Chris and Francis Butt from Winterbrook. Also tomorrow, a happy 51st anniversary to Ken and Doreen Russell in Bay Roberts. Happy anniversary yesterday to Ivy and Harvey Avery in Deep Bite. Alec and Marjorie Callahan celebrating 60 years of marriage on November 25th. They're from Botwood, now living in Brampton. Happy 60th anniversary to Don and Mabel Best of Fogo. They celebrated on Wednesday. And happy 64th anniversary also yesterday to Ambrose and Marina Loveless of Seal Cove, Fortune Bay. Yesterday, also a happy 54th wedding anniversary to Herb and Vera Butler in Paradise. Anniversary greetings out to Malcolm and Jane Blanchard. They celebrated 61 years together yesterday. And 50th anniversary greetings going out to Dawn and Ivy Green in Mount Pearl. On Wednesday, it was a 60th anniversary celebration for Harry and Eileen Noseworthy from Botwood. Happy 51st anniversary to George and Joan Cram from Botwood. Wishing Edward and Glorina T of Goose Bay a happy 50th anniversary. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Arthur and Rita Rideout of Long Pond. Now to some birthdays. Birthday greetings going out to Pearl Nippard of Main Point, Gander Bay. It's her 90th birthday. Happy birthday to Jesse Squires 
of St. John's who turns 90 on Sunday. Happy 90th birthday also to Alvin Wheeler in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 94th birthday last Friday to Ann Baker of Newman's Cove, now living in Bonavista. And happy 90th birthday tomorrow to Fern Murphy in Corner Brook. Happy 96th birthday yesterday to Susanna McDonald from West St. Modeste, Labrador, now living in Forto. Birthday wishes to Donald Bragg from Pillies Island. He turns 90 on Sunday. And happy birthday to Dulcie Genge from Anchor Point, who celebrated her 93rd birthday on Tuesday. She now lives in Flowers Cove. Happy 93rd birthday as well uh, to Ken Yetman from Southern Bay. He celebrated yesterday. On Tuesday, Gordon Bungay from Grand Bank celebrated his 94th birthday. On Monday, Edith Piercy in Burgio celebrated her 90th birthday. Happy 99th birthday last Thursday to Isabel Power in Cupids. Happy 94th birthday yesterday to Florence Queenie George. Florence is from Corner Brook and now lives in Mount Pearl. Another fine crowd. Congratulations once again. Well, <laughs> Before we go, something uh, pretty cool uh, to show you before we get into the weather. Uh, researchers in Thailand have unearthed a very rare find. Yeah, they've discovered that a nearly intact skeleton of a Buddhist whale. Yeah, the skeleton is believed to be between 3,000 and 5,000 years old. It's about 12 meters long and it's partly fossilized. Yeah, these whales still exist in the waters off Thailand and the skeleton was found near Bangkok, about 12 kilometers inland from the current coastline. Researchers say that they'll give them information about changes in sea levels and biodiversity. Wow. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Well, uh, tomorrow we are going to see rain and wind and mild temperatures in the east. It will be a little cooler as you head towards the western portion of the island with generally light winds and then the potential for some flurries uh, into the evening hours for the northern peninsula as your temperatures hover around the one degree mark. Plenty of sunshine up across the big land, a little windy for the north and then the potential for some showers uh, along or flurries rather along the strait and in lab west. As far as snowfall accumulations go Saturday night into Sunday afternoon and evening hours could pick up somewhere between five to 10 centimeters for areas in southeastern and northern uh, the northern portion of the island and then temperatures will drop significantly back down to those single digits through the day. Mm -hmm. So wintry in Labrador. Have a great weekend. <laughs> Good night everyone.